those things about not using, you know, the single use plastic bottles and those kinds of things. And then all of a sudden I'll, I'll find myself with one in my hand mm -hmm. somehow. It's like, how did this happen? <laughs> you know? Um, and it's that being consistent and, and being aware. So I just, those are just some of my um, first impressions from the film. It's the first time I saw the film. So thank you for uh, sharing it with us. Good evening, I'm Amy David and I am the Director of Ocean Policy at Monterey Bay Aquarium. I am very, very fortunate to be at an aquarium that actually has a policy program. Uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium uh, not only is uh, one of the most beautiful places to see wildlife, um, we are also very active in trying to protect it. And um, we are very fortunate to have an inspired staff that is willing to roll up their sleeves and tackle problems just like the one we saw on the screen tonight. And so last year we celebrated a great victory with all of you when California voters voted to um, keep the nation's first statewide plastic bag ban in place when you voted yes on Prop 67. Yeah. So give yourselves a hand for that. We have taken on plastic pollution as one of our key issues, um, which, and I am trying to lead that initiative, and I'm doing so with a network of about 20 aquariums across the country who are gonna work in three ways. One is we're gonna work to raise consumer demand. None of this will happen if consumers don't demand it. We have a really good model to follow, which is our Seafood Watch program, which started with a card for consumers. How many people right now either have the card in their pocket or have the app on their phone? Awesome. <laughs> um, so we want more consumers. We want to raise consumer demand. We want to send a signal to industry that things need to change. We're also working to get single-use plastic out of aquariums across the country. Monterey Bay Aquarium has done a wonderful job in getting especially the most egregious forms of plastic out of our gift and restaurant, and so we want to work with aquariums across the country to do that, and then to work with our vendors and consumer brands like Coke and Pepsi to have them make more comprehensive change. And then finally, we want to keep going after those policies um, that will uh, take consumer demand and translate it into comprehensive policies and practices that are adopted by the entire industry. And in the US, we are a model for the rest of the world we might not have the most leakage of plastic products into the ocean, but what we do is we export practices. We were the first to adopt single-use plastic practices, and we can be the first to usher in a new era of alternatives. Thanks. Hi, I'm Jackie Nunez, and I'm founder of The Last Plastic Straw, and also I'm a sanctuary steward for Save Our Shores here in San Jose. And this project started uh, back in 2010, 2011, and um, now it's, it's grown, it's gone worldwide, and uh, just got signed on with Plastic Pollution Coalition. So we're doing some exciting work, and um, also working with the aquarium, it's been, it's been great. And uh, just kind of spreading the word, and, and to me, straws are the, people call it the low-hanging fruit, but I, I call it the gateway issue. A lot of people don't think about straws when they go out. And it's a real eye-opening, um, easy, tangible thing that people can do once they say no to a straw. And it's, it's uh, really powerful. And it's uh, proven to really start to start that behavior change and get the ball rolling. So it's been uh, really exciting uh, last year for me but since the uh, turtle video went viral and, and you guys are had the privy of the seeing that, or actually the, uh, yeah, the horror of seeing that that video. But that really, actually, that was a lot of people's last plastic straw moment. And so um, it's a really easy, tangible thing that you can do today, and instantly get one piece of plastic out of the equation. Thank you. I'm again Kathleen Lee. Uh, I do have the pleasure of working for Congressman Jimmy Panetta, and for me, what's really important is. I, I always call myself the child of the sea. My dad grew up in this area, uh, skin diving off of Lover's Point, and instilled in me this incredible love of the ocean. So when I need a little regroup and reset, first thing I do is get my toes in that cold, cold water. 
but what it means for me is that now on the public policy side, we can listen to stories like what we, the film that we saw tonight and, and different projects of what individuals are doing and try and make that happen on a national level. So Congressman Panetta is on uh, the Committee for Natural Resources. So that's a great platform to be able to spread the advocacy and the issues here. Um, he was a member of the Sanctuary Advisory Council, so certainly working with that. But what I know as somebody who studied public policy for a long time is it starts small and it starts local and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So everybody making an individual choice to refuse a plastic straw and have the business owners start to see, hey, my customers are asking for alternatives or they're, they're leaving these behind, why am I spending money on it? That, that bubbles up and it really helps support policy. So, uh, you know, one thing that, that strikes me tonight is there's a lot of very small choices that we can all individually make that help. Um, and it's all of us working together in these different facets that will help improve public policy. So like we'll work with the Monterey Bay Aquarium and others to improve not only what's happening here in California, but United States, and then hopefully export that. And at the same time, I was making a note about Germany. Like how do, how do we take some of those best practices internationally and bring them here to the US and, and always be looking for ways that we can make improvements in our communities and our culture. Hello, hello. We'll start the questions, and uh, so raise your hand if you have a question. All right. For years I've been using cloth bags at the grocery store, which means when I get home and I, get, I do have garbage, but what do I put it in? plastic bag. I don't have paper bags because I use cloth bags. So what do I do? Is it clear? Yeah. yeah I, mean, I use seventh generation plastic bags, but it's, I believe it's still plastic. So I don't know what to do. So. Any ideas? Any ideas? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so you, you know, you've got bins, you've got, you know, we've got these three big bins, and so they're you know, put as much into those bins that require no bags as possible. Then you've got the compostables, right? Then you got the stuff that can, doesn't really need to be thrown in a bag necessarily, or a paper bag if you can put some of the stuff in. And then what you're left with is the stuff that you want to put in a plastic bag. But now you're probably down to maybe a tenth of the plastic bags that you would have been starting with uh, earlier. And so there's, that's the starting point. Now some other people may have ideas of, you know, the non-plastic ba bags that actually work, that don't tear apart and then you create a whole other problem. So now you're using sponges and more water and more yeah. plastic to clean it up perhaps. Um, but just do, do your absolute best. And here's, here's the thing that you don't always hear in environmental conversations. Don't beat yourself up. <laughs> Don't walk around with this heavy, heavy guilt because then your creativity, your compassion, your empathy, your ability to communicate, it goes right out the window. And we environmentalists do guilt and fear really well, and we do it way too much. We, we bum people out a lot. And so you gotta be, gotta be careful that you don't just absolutely bum yourself out to the point that you lose all your creativity because we need all of that. So that's, that's the best I can do, kind of on the fly here. I don't know if anybody wants to add that. I think um, you bring up a very good point. Um, for the last 50 years, we have had a society develop around us that makes it incredibly easy and convenient to use plastic. And it's gonna take a lot longer to um, have a society <coughs> built so you don't automat so you have ready alternatives instead of having to kind of invent your own system at home like they're doing on Navy ships in, in Germany, right? So part of this is we need to, to raise awareness and demand by consumers to drive the innovation that it's gonna take to get to make it an everyday occurrence. 
For example, I use sustainable seafood as an analogy all the time. We need those few loud people to have industry become more sustainable. So when you go to the grocery store, you have no choice but to buy sustainable seafood because that's all there is. And so I, uh, I hate to say that it is, it's gonna take a while, um, but I completely appreciate Jay's point about not beating yourself up. Believe me, it's been very hard for me personally to do this, and it's my job to do it now. <laughs> so um, the other is to just make sure you take whatever opportunity you can to have, uh, to kind of uh, have your voice be heard on this subject um, and to vote, to um, join movements, um, because anything we can do to amplify um, and s increase that signal to industry and government, that's what's gonna spark that change. Utterly unsatisfying, aren't, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> Um, sewage outfills that discharge into Monterey Bay and that's the sanctuary um, required to filter out completely or monitor the level of microplastics and bees in their bathrooms. I'll take a stab at that. I, I do not believe that they're required to, to monitor for microplastics. Um, that would be something to ask of the Regional Water Quality Control Board, which is the permitting authority for the sewage discharge. Um, that would be a very interesting thing to do. One of the studies that we're interested in is uh, better understanding uh, the amount of microplastics, we saw some of it in the film, that ends up in fish. And so we're doing, uh, every time that we're out and we're doing uh, trawl studies, uh, we're looking at the contents of fish. So I think those kinds of studies will loop back to the sources um, and then through things like public policy we can force uh, the permitting agencies to require that kind of monitoring to see you know, just the level of, of, um, of deposition or, or impact that that's having. That's a good question. On the microplastic stuff, there's a, there's, I'm on the board of a group up in Oregon called Sea Turtles Forever. And they've got a project called Blue Wave. And there, it's for just this really simple thing. It's like two, two tubes or that create a frame and then this, this basically uh, a screen. And so when you go and do a beach cleanup, you know, we pick up all the big stuff and we think, oh, the beach is clean. If you were to pass some of that sand through one of these screens, you'd be just astounded at how much of that sand isn't really sand. But it gets hung up because of the static electricity in the screen and then you can, you can take that off and collect that as well. Um, Mike in the film said, we're not gonna filter the whole ocean, and we're probably not gonna filter every beach either, but we can try a little bit and see what happens. And so if you are involved in a beach cleanup project, um, get one of those screens or make one yourself and, uh, and just add that to your toolkit. And it's really interesting to get out there and, and filter out a whole bunch of beach sand. And, uh, it's really good exercise too. And then call your local paper and have them write a story yes. about it. <laughs> Hi, my name's Lauren Cottrell, and um, I started, I grew up here in Carmel. I went to river school, middle school, graduated this high school. We didn't have this beautiful performing arts center at the time. Um, and I moved back home last year and was really sad about the beach. There was so much trash on it. So I started something called Lovers of Carmel Beach. And uh, I'm raising $1,600, an eight-month program, and we're going to pay two stu the students twice a week because the city only picks up our beach once a week, and it's not enough. I go down the day after and pick up, and all last summer I documented all the bags of trash I picked up. And uh, I'm going to pay a student $25 every time they go down, twice a week to zigzag so that we'll have somebody on Carmel Beach three times a week picking up. And it makes a big difference. So uh, I have a Facebook site and there's a GoFundMe site. We've raised half, half the funds so far for our $1,600. Um, but Carmel Bay is a tiny little place, but it's a place I love and it's my home. So, and the people that are involved are very happy. Uh, we've joined with the Carmel Youth Center to do this, there's a list and their students are signing up to pick up. 
So I just wanted to let Carmel know that that was happening. Lovers of Carmel Beach, and there's a website too. Thank you. like avoiding plastic in your everyday life seems like a very daunting task because we're surrounded by it no matter where we are. So for the panelists, how has eliminating plastic in your life have, has been a positive impact? Um, for me, it's, um, it ends up being cheaper as well and healthier. Um, we, and I can say that because we live, we do live in a bubble, and we have a lot of um, great farmers markets and a lot of um, access to, to food in bulk. Um, and you end up eating healthier too. One of the things that I do is I, we, we strive to go in the outer aisles, because uh, that's where you get most of the, the fresh food. When you go in the inner aisles, that's all the processed food, right? So that's not only the, the overpackaged food, but the processed food that's really the non-food, non-nutritious, Kind of stuff, so we kind of strive for that. Um, yeah, I can I can go on and on, but uh, <laughs> one but has your life changed dramatically since you started focusing on eliminating those day to day plastic items? Yeah, it it, it has. We we live in a house with like five people, and it's amazing to see um, how little we we actually generate in trash, and you end up uh, really getting a handle on it. Mm. Um, one of the things that, that we mentioned, that Jay was mentioning when you asked about plastic bags or trash can, you ends up you don't really need it when you start composting and doing anything. And, and we're actually set up in California to do this because we just passed a statewide um, measure with uh, Governor Brown, I think it's like AB 2026, it's, it's gonna be mandated statewide composting. So it's not a matter of if, it's just when all of our communities are gonna be composting. And so, you'll realize how, how little uh, trash you generate um, and, and how much you know, methane gas goes off because of the, the food waste. So it's, it also helps us with our climate goals. So it makes it a lot easier to really got to get a handle on, on what you're doing and stuff and you end up generating less waste for it. I'll just add a little funny anecdote and I think it maybe speaks to all of our efforts just when you think you're doing it all, you realize you're just scratching the surface. And I thought I was pretty good at home with all my recycling and reusing. Um, it dawned on me one morning when I was watching the, my trash get picked up that I seem to be the only one that really cares about these plastic bags because once they pick it up and they dump it in their truck, it's just trash, right? So I stopped using, what I do is I just reuse this plastic bag. It's like a transport device that I use. I just take it to my trash can and dump the trash. It makes the trash can kind of nasty after a while that you can just wash it out. But I realized watching the truck in the morning that um, they don't care that it's in a plastic bag or not because they just dump it in the truck and it drives away. But recently, uh, my daughter came home from college and um, went through my garbage <laughs> and was giving me a hard time about this needs to go over here, this could go over here. You don't really need to throw this away. This could go in the green and out. Okay, so sometimes I think it takes others to help you, especially the younger generation. So it was just a funny story. I thought I was doing well, but I apparently wasn't doing that great. I, I would add that um, in, in the quest, and, and I, I have to say, if I speak for myself at least, I think I fail in some way every day to try to reach this lofty goal that I, I have for my myself. And at least once a day, I sort of hit a wall or some, you know, I put my plastic glasses on or, or some, something and it bugs me. Um, so again, don't beat up on yourself. But a lot of my best friends are people that I've met through our shared interest in this issue. And, and I'll put, you know, Jack and Alex and, and their families in that that new that category is new friends, and they tend to be great people. Like some of the best people I know are, you know, people like these and people like you, and and so that's that's made my life uh, better and significantly. And 
you know, drastically even to be <laughs> networked with great people. Um, so that's cool, right? <laughs> 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 you know, I think for me, it's that thought about the blue whales um, and, and what they might be consuming. And, for, and the reason I picked that is just the incredible upsurge that we've had recently of the blues and the humpbacks and the gray whales in our backyard here. So I think about, okay, what can I do to help the blue whale out there and to help the, the humpbacks here in Monterey Bay and the gray whales. Um, because it, it all starts with us and you know that horrifying picture of the sea bird and, and their stomachs full, it, it just it breaks your heart a bit. And it, you know, I think about a, no plastic straw. I go, well that means I don't need a lid. So now there's not one but two pieces of plastic that are out. So you know, it, it's just all those little things um, you know, I kind of, I have an affinity for whales, so that's where I went to, but uh, all of those impacts on the marine life and then recognizing that I have a small part in that uh, was a sobering thought. So I think that's, for me, the most impactful. Yeah, well, for me, the, you know, the scenes when you go to the other countries and see the real impact, that's really heart-wrenching for me. And I, I like to travel around a lot, and, um, and that's really what brought me on my journey as well. Because I, uh, I was in, in Belize, and what got me going, and I had my last plastic straw moment was we were out in the middle of the, this this protected marine sanctuary, and we were diving, and it was beautiful, and, and it was a uh, world heritage site, so they weren't even getting fish, the, the fish, and it was just we were having a great time. And the storm came through the next day. We were out there about you know 40 miles out, and a river of trash, mostly plastic, just came by me out there. And I was really dejected, you know, when I came back to Monterey Bay and I was volunteering for Save Our Shores and clean up, but I was really like, well, this has got to stop. And um, it's one thing to clean it up, and it's great that they have all this innovative stuff, but also what, what kills me about that too is incineration and everything, and, and it's not that clean energy that they're talking about either. There's still nasty pollutants going into the air. Um, so it is one way to deal with the trash that's out there, but to me it's like a hole in a boat and you keep bailing, like they need to plug that hole. And um, so that's really got, got me on my journey when, when that happens. And then I had the, the aha moment about the straw and how that would be a, a way to just kind of, just kind of raise awareness about the absurdity of single use plastic. Um, I made a point this year that when I speak about plastic is not to use industry terms anymore. Um, I don't say disposable plastic anymore because mm -hmm. it doesn't dispose, doesn't fit that definition. You know, I say single-use plastic. Um, I don't say recyclable because at such an abysmal uh, recycle rate, that doesn't fit the definition of recycle. And even what does get recycled is usually just downcycled once and ends up in our environment. I don't say landfill, I say it ends up in our environment because our landfills are our environment. So just really the, the real awareness about what plastic really is, especially single use uh, and, and what they're doing. And it's just kind of time to, you know, kind of wake up, open your eyes, and there's little things we can do. Again, we're not perfect, I'm not trying to make them, but there's just, personally, that's, that's what I do when I travel now. I try to be plastic free, you know. We talk about where we're at, but we still are cleaning up the beaches. You know, we have this great um, this, this waste system. We're recycling, we're composting, we're doing all these things, yet, you know, we're still picking up trash on our beaches. We can't handle this stuff either. And then we're shipping off to countries that don't even have municipal waste. So, that's a, so it really struck me too when they were talking about the six places where it just is going instantly into the water, you know. But what about this? 10 companies that are actually producing all this stuff. You know, there's a, a study came out about the 10 corporations that are actually producing all the food in the world, all the industrialized food. So it's like, you know, Mars, uh, 
uh, Nestle and these guys, and then Unilever, and then you see this graph of all the other food companies. So it's, yes, we do need to figure out what to do with this trash, but we also need to talk to these companies and have them clean up their act and what they're pushing out into our environment. great segue into what was the most impactful scene for me. Unfortunately, in my line of work, I've seen a lot of pictures of animals, um, which is devastating the first time I saw it, continues to be devastating now. Now that I am focused on solutions, one of the most telling scenes for me was that it's not often you have an environmental disaster with the name of the company responsible mm. for doing it on the back. Um, and because of, I'm sure that was in the press, I'm sure that their consumers were part of the Facebook crowd that quickly galvanized and they were out there cleaning the beach. We were trying to pass, this was several years ago, we were trying to pass an extended producer responsibility bill in California and we did a poll of California voters and we said, who do you think is most responsible for the plastic pollution problem? And the majority of people said consumers, they pointed to themselves. They didn't point to the companies that were responsible for producing the products in the first place. And I thought that was really telling because one of the things that we want to do is we want to make um, the producers more accountable for their, their products. Or at least include, right now, disposal of, of products is an externality. It's not internalized in the cost of doing business. And we want to, to change that. Um, but first, I think people need to give themselves a break and to understand that um, there are others that are just as accountable um, as we are as individuals in our choices. Yeah, I'll say for me the most impactful scenes, like Amy, you know, I tend, I have seen a lot of the animal scenes of you know, the plastic contents and uh, in the stomachs, and and that bothers me not just because of the visual part of it, but because somehow I feel like I've become hardened a little bit to it. I've seen so much of it, and it bothers me that that would be normal now, that I just expect to see that. But what impacted me the most was seeing the kids play in all that trash. Um, and that, that was just heartbreaking to me because, um, you know, that, that, that's a new baseline for their lives, right? And that's the, their normal is, is that, and how have we let that come to be? That shouldn't be, and um, I guess that was the thing that impacted me the most, because we don't see that level uh, uh, here. You see that in places like that, and that just, uh, that, that kind of hit me. I also would add that all the main protagonists in the film started out by telling their stories about when they were kids, falling in love with the ocean. And so that, in contrast, false point of the, you know, the kids, kids in the film having their ocean experiences be, be you know, contaminated and having that be their normal. And I think just something to think through for yourself. Like how, when did you fall in love with the ocean? And who were you with? And how old were you? What was the name of the water? And what were the circumstances? And was it cleaner than it is now? Probably. Um, and so that's part of what's on the line. You don't think about it, but you know, um, the woman who's cleaning up the beaches in Carmel, every time you clean that beach up, you, you may be setting the stage for a kid who comes and just falls in love with the ocean for the first time and isn't distracted by the trash and doesn't need to clean it up. And so that's, that's one of the gifts that you're, you're creating, and we all are when we, when we do this work. So, Um, so I was wondering, um, because in my mind, it's one thing to replace single-use plastic, but what about the plastic that's harder to replace, like the plastic in shoe soles and stitching in clothes and glues that are used everywhere? We, we, we have off the shelf right now uh, alternatives to everything that we would like to stop using, period. Whether it's what we drive, what drives our cars, or what, what lights up our homes, or what the bottom of your shoes are made of, or in any of it, we have 
off-the-shelf solutions existing now, right? We just, we lack the political and personal will to, to pull them all together from around the world, all the great examples, and, and, and put them into motion for reasons, political reasons we can get into, but, um, so that's my short answer. Thank you everyone for being here. It's very exciting to see a full auditorium. My name is Trisha, and I try very hard not to, um, I mean, it's just constant, the amount of plastic, as hard as I work on um, my children to not um, produce more plastic. It's, it's, you know, the inner lining, it's the cellophane, it's the, it's just, I don't use plastic bags in my garbage can, I jet spray out my, my garbage can. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so uh, what got, a lot got me, but what I wanna also point out is, is our staples like milk, milk for our children um, comes in plastic bottles. And um, you know, we're hearing about, you know, we know about hormone destructing Plastics, but how do we know our milk bottle? I mean, you know, and I, I'm old enough to say I remember when the milkman <laughs> used to come, and it was almost like uh, I don't know. I don't want to call him compare him to Santa Claus, but he was a nice man, and he brought the milk in the glass bottles, and it was in a metal thing, and he came, and he was polite, and you know, it was part of our community. But now it's. We don't have a choice right now. How do we make that a choice? How do we make a thing like milk a choice? Bye, Cal. <laughs> I just wanted to piggyback on what you said. I think for me the takeaway is the consciousness in my decisions each day. I'm not going to be successful every single time. But the consciousness of the lid at Starbucks or the consciousness of what I'm picking up. I think after today, I'll think twice about that. And I have a child that might hold me accountable to that. Um, and so I really thank you so much because as depressed as I am right now, yeah. and as nauseated <laughs> by seeing those animals, it's just totally distressing. I am hopeful that today I'll walk away and make small changes that will, you know, maybe someone will see me say no lid or no straw and maybe that will have an impact and maybe I have to believe that our little steps will ripple and have an impact overall. Yeah. We have to try, I guess, is my takeaway. So thank yeah. you all for being here. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Alex and um, Jack, Jack, <laughs> for opening um, my eyes and in this experience with you. Uh, it's just been really gratifying and joy-filling. So, thank you. So, yeah, so um, one of the things that uh, you can do, and actually a really great resource, uh, and uh, if, if you guys got that little flyer that got passed out, Plastic Free July, starting in Australia, and now it's going worldwide, and we want to do it here in Monterey in Monterey Bay, and we're challenging um, other towns uh, that are boarding the Monterey Bay Green Sanctuary. So what it is, it's one month of July, and you can try to go plastic free, and you can do um, for the, just the top four items, um, which I think is a, a renewal water bottle, um, coffee cup, uh, refused plastic straws, renewal bag, um, or you can go whole hog, like, you know, I'm going to try it. And it's really great, it's got a lot of great resources, like what do you do for toothpaste, what do you do whatever, and there's, when you sign up, there's a, I, I, I put the links in there for you to sign up, you can sign up the, you can sign up your school, you can sign up organizations, but I'm really challenging you guys to try Plastic Free July, it's a good way to, to try it, you just get a segue into it, and you get a lot of information, you get a lot of support, so when you sign up for this, they give you um, uh, emails, and you go, what do you do for this, it's like you get a little self-help group, and one of the things that they do is, is, is that you realize, you know, you can't do it all. You can't be totally plastic free, but you have, you start, you know, saving a little like um, bag of shame, you know, like this is what I generated and, and you have all that support, but it's a, it's a great way to just kind of look at what you do and see 
be creative, like, like Jay said, and what your alternatives are and how you can do it. And it's a great way to start. And I think it's a, for our communities especially, because we love Monterey Bay, and we have so many tourists coming in here, it's a perfect month to try this as a community because we're also educating people coming to our bay that we want to protect this bay and we want to you know, live in a way and, and people who visit us not catch our bay either. So I really urge you to um, get online. I, I just ad hoc, <laughs> the, the, right before getting here, I made a Facebook page, but uh, don't go on it yet because all I did was just put it in there. But I'll have information there and hopefully, I'm hoping other communities uh, that are bartering the bay uh, will take this on as well and you can, um, we can just share information. And I don't know, I, I call it a challenge. Maybe we can challenge each community and see how we do. And, and you asked the question, what can we do? I think there's two important things that you can do every day is, as a consumer, what you're willing to buy, if you're willing to spend a little bit mon more money for a glass container and buy your milk from, you know, with a glass container or go to a farmer's market, those things have impact because people will see you doing it, they'll start to go, oh, where did you get that? And you know, have a nice conversation. Uh, that has an enormous impact. And the people who are producing these things, look at that carefully. And so I think of, you know, sometimes when this is very daunting, look at what we've done in the last five years, what we've done in the last 10 years to make more mainstream a lot of these options. And Californians really have stood up to say, we're not interested in plastic bags. And so the great affirmation of that plastic bag ban was incredibly um, heartwarming for me because there was a big lobby against it, and that's hard. But the other thing you can all do um, as the, somebody on the receiving end of it is call your legislators, you know, talk to them, email them. It's so easy to do at two o'clock in the morning if you're not sleeping, is just dash off an email. Um, <laughs> But you know, there are a lot of people who spend a lot of time listening to what folks want. And I know sometimes in local and national politics, it doesn't always feel that way, but I'll tell you, it really does make a difference. So if you vote by actually voting, uh, use your pocketbook to make a difference. Use your, the power of your voice to talk to your friends, to talk to your legislators, to talk to the people around you that all makes a, an incredible difference. And the thing that I'm heartened by is just all the kids in the audience. Um, what you are growing up in, hopefully we will make better because we've made it worse, but we're gonna try as adults now to make it better for you. But the mindfulness that you have and the choices that you can make will have a huge impact on the world when one day you'll be older and sitting up here talking to, to future kids, but uh, everybody here has the ability to make a difference, and I, I think we've all kind of seen that, but uh, we can take away what it is that don't feel hopeless because you do have the ability to affect change. So Kathleen, I'm going to double down on what you just said, and I'm going to ask every single person in this room to get home tonight and shoot off an email to Congressman Panetta. Um, and say, hey, I'm in your district, I went to this screening, just want to say plastic pollution is an issue. Period, sign your name, send it off. And then if you're feeling super motivated, <laughs> you can send the same exact email, cut and paste, to Kamala Harris, our new senator. Um, just that little thing actually means a whole lot, and it makes my job easier when I show up in their office and say that their constituency cares and wants them to go home. This is <coughs> Yeah, I'm going to trip, I'll trickle down on that and, uh, and, and just suggest that I think that even the bigger enemy than plastic pollution is cynicism. And I, you know, you, we all encounter it daily. And guard, just particularly young folks, guard yourself against it. Do whatever you need to do to just keep it out of your brain and out of your life. And going home and doing ex exactly that. Follow up, reach out, do do you know act act out act out. Um, at the end of the film, when he's going around, he's like, "I really love that super yummy extra squeezed organic bee juice, but <laughs> does it come in anything besides plastic?" And the guy's like, "I don't know." And he's like, "Well, put it in my hand, you know, put the bee juice in my hand, um, but do that." And you have those conversations wherever you go, and make it and be kind. But don't become cynical and 
engage and um, and let your you know let your heart break uh, because this is heartbreaking. Uh, if your heart you know if, lean into it and let those animals break your heart. Let those kids break your heart because it's heartbreaking. Uh, don't don't shrink away from it. Just let your heart break into a million pieces. Put it back together and get out there and clean up the beach. So that's that's my triple down. Maybe we have one more there. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah.